Okay, we are going to talk about schistosomiasis. Um, schistosomiasis are uh, caused by the schistomes. Um, these guys don't get as much uh, airtime as they likely deserve. Um, I think malaria kind of eats up almost our entire um, parasitic uh, focus, but schistosomes are a major cause of disease worldwide. And here we're actually fairly lucky because we actually have a local expert on schistosomes, um, Dr. Williams over in um, immunology and microbiology, who's been studying these uh, his whole career. So if you want to talk to someone who's really knowledgeable about schistomes, I actually called him when prepping for this video. He's a great resource. Um, in the meantime, let's talk about schistomes. Schistomes are flukes, and no, I do not mean that they are rare. I mean, if anything, they are a major cause of disease, but flukes are actually a type of worm, and schistomes are definitely worms. So we don't see um, schistosomiasis really here in the United States, um, but they are um, a major cause of disease in the tropics. They're a trematode. Um, so trematodes typically means that these are flat, leafy shaped types of worms that have two muscular suckers. They have like an oral type, which is kind of the beginning of their digestive tract, and then a ventral sucker, which actually allows them to attach to our organs. Um, most flukes are hermaphroditic, but schistosomes are not. Um, schistosomes actually have both um, kind of a male and female um, gender. Um, so, um, so these are kind of another difference between them. They also, as kind of, they kind of break all the rules because even though they're a trematode and should kind of have that um, flat, fleshy, leaf-shaped body, they actually have kind of a rounder worm um, conformation, which I, I think I show a picture of it in the notes. So they actually have like a cylindrical body that's more sem similar to like a nematode than a trematode, but you know potato potato um all right so all flukes without exception even schistos uh have an intermediate host and that intermediate host is a mollusk so why is that important to you because one day you'll be reading a vignette or looking at a you know on key flash card or something like that and somebody's going to say the word snail or oyster or clam, and I want you to immediately think of schistosomiasis. Now, that doesn't rule out some of the bacterial infections or like hepatitis A, um, but schisto should definitely be on your list if you're thinking of shellfish, um, specifically mollusks. There are also a whole bunch of other buzzwords for um, schistosomas that I want you to kind of think of. So in addition to snails, because that's actually the major one, um, schisto is actually a major cause of bladder cancer, um, or at least a major association with bladder cancer. It also has a major association with cirrhosis, and it causes a, a, tif, a, a, a specific type of fibrosis, which is known as clay pipe stem. Um, and you'll hear more about this from your pathology discipline directors, but these are just kind of buzzwords to keep in mind when you're thinking of a schistosomiasis. Um, schistosomiasis also has a specific syndrome it causes as kind of part of its course, and that's known as Katayama, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about the clinical course. And it also can be associated with swimmer's itch, um, which was kind of surprising to me, because when I think of swimmer's itch, you know, like you do, um, I actually tend to think of uh, tinnias, but um, schistos can also play a role in that one. Um, so there are three major species of schistosomiasis, um, or schistosomas. Uh, so there's schistosoma mansoni, schistosoma hematobium, and schistosoma Jap japonicum. Um, too many Latin words in a row. But those are kind of your three schistosomes that you might think of. The infective form is actually a skin penetrating cercariae. Um, so basically it becomes, it busts out of the snail, it becomes liberated from the snail, it gets on your skin, and then it burrows its way through your skin. Um, they're a freshwater creature, um, and we typically find them in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, and actually, this is one of those ones where we're kind of doing this to ourselves. The adult schistosomas 
are really great at cloak and dagger. Um, they actually are able to hide themselves in host antigens in such a way that you can actually follow the antigenic variation response where first your cells will respond to this antigen. And then it's almost like the worm then kind of changes its stripes and now it's making this antigen. So the worm now no longer has blue antigen, even though all of our T cells and B cells are specific for blue antigen. Now the worm has green antigen. And then, okay, so we switch again and all of our T and B cells are now specific for green and blue antigen. Well, now the worm has changed again and it's purple antigen. And what we find is that we can actually see kind of the worm antigen variation peak and fall with the peak of our own immune response. So if this is kind of worm burden over here and over here is our immune response, you know, for each of these, we'll see our immune response kind of, I'm going to show it in a dotted line, come up and then the worm changes. So then it comes up again to this one and the worm changes and it comes up again to this one and the worm changes. So it's a really intricate and kind of beautiful um, dance between the schistosoma and the immune response. So that that's part of what I love and hate about schistosomiasis because I mean, no matter what we do, we're constantly one step behind it because by the time we've mounted an appropriate immune response to that particular parasitic antigen, it's already like the, the parasitic pool is already growing with a completely different uh, antigen. It's like constantly switching addresses. Um, okay, so let's talk about its lifestyle because this is supposed to be about microbiology, not immunology right now. Um, so we already talked about the infective form and that's the skin penetrating um, cercariae. Um, it has, you know, this slam of uh, this snail intermediate life form, um, which I'm actually showing here. So you can see that here um, where it actually kind of develops into the um, where it actually gets access okay so basically infection occurs when you have these free swimming freshwater cercariae that penetrate intact skin enter the circulation so it comes in it enters the circulation um, and then it actually um, it actually can develop into in the intrahepatic portal circulation or in the vesicle, prostatic, rectal, and uterine plexuses and veins. Um, they are obligate intravascular parasites. They kind of need to be found in um, areas full of blood. You're not going to find them in cavities or ducts or other tissues. They're going to be found in kind of these weird little niche places. Um, so th that's where we're expecting to find them. This is actually, I, I kind of love this gross picture here, but this is literally one of the uh, worms that is actually making its way out uh, through the skin. So it probably got too big for whatever vascular port it was in, in this person's foot and just kind of popped its way out of there um, or was removed uh, by hopefully a medical professional, but we'll see. Um, okay, so that's kind of the life cycle. I do want to touch on the immunopathogenesis again. Um, like I said, they're remarkably good at disguise. Um, this is actually due to VSGs, which is literally um, what the antigen is that the parasite is kind of coated in, and we kind of make different immune responses to them, but they're not um, they're not effective. Okay, so the worm kind of coats itself in these VSGs, leading to very little immune response to the actual adult worm. Um, because of this incredible immune evasion, there is chronic infection. Um, it can last 20 to 30 years, really, and that's not at all uncommon. Um, when it's reproducing, a male and female worm can come together to produce anywhere from 300 to 3,000 eggs daily for 30 years. Just think about that unconscionable number of eggs. Um, and the eggs 
are actually what we respond to. The eggs are what the immune response is largely made to, and that's actually what leads to disease. So you get this inflammatory reaction with mononuclear and polymorphonuclear cell infiltrate, you get formation of abscesses, um, and then additionally, the larva inside the egg actually produce enzymes that further aid in tissue destruction. And that's what actually allows the egg to kind of pass through the mucosa into the lumen of say the bowel and the bladder. Um, and at that point, they can actually be passed to the external environment in feces and urine, which is then how they get picked up by snails again, because they're kind of free floating then. Um, where do we find these guys? So I think I already mentioned this, but so S. mansoni, we're actually gonna find that in um, Africa and in Saudi Arabia, and then also in Madagascar, um, just kind of, those are the places most associated. Um, S. japonica, that one we're actually gonna find in China, the Philippines, and I'm gonna guess, bet you can guess the last one, Japan. Um, and then Hamedobium, uh, um, that one we're gonna find in the Nile River Valley. Okay, so infection is typically first acquired when people are in their childhood, so children. Um, and then the prevalence and the intensity of the infection tends to peak around 15 to 20 years of age. Um, and then there's actually kind of a reservoir for these. We aren't the only place that these guys hang out. So um, you could see it in domestic animals, cats, dogs, things like that. You can also see it in primates, rodents, marsupials. Um, and so you can kind of see it all over. I think something that's also worth noting about this is that this is a freshwater parasite, right? So whenever we need to, whenever we think about freshwater parasites, there's something um, intrinsically linked to us because all humans need fresh, clean water. So schistosomiasis actually then inadvertently becomes a disease of economic progress. Because as we have development of land and irrigation and projects into desert and tropical areas, we actually see dispersion of infected humans and snails to previously uninvolved areas. Okay, so I keep saying this word schistosomiasis. So what is it? Well, first off, there are a couple other names for it. Um, there's bilharziasis um, or snail fever. Those are the other terms people sometimes use for it. Um, it is a major parasitic infection of the tropics. It affects about 200 million people um, worldwide. Um, and like I said before, it's a result of the body's reactions to the worm's eggs, pretty much. Um, so basically, it can take place over the course of many years, and it can be an acute presentation that then can also manifest chronically. And then there's also kind of this, I don't know how to put it, it's not really like an intermediate, but if you had an acute infection, and then years, years, years later, you kind of get infected again with either a different strain or a different species or a different antigenic variation, um, then you can kind of experience that reinfection, an acute reinfection. And that's actually what is going to lead to Katayama syndrome, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, so over the course of years, as patients have repeated significant intense immune responses to the worms, they develop um, hepatosplenomegaly, which is um, what I'm showing here. Um, so this hepatosplenomegaly, you, you can, I mean, this is obviously the entire abdominal uh, colon, it, uh, abdominal cavity is actually swollen, but this patient would probably also have significant swelling of the liver and spleen. You'd also see lymphadenopathy, um, squamous cell bladder carcinoma is common, um, transverse myelitis, cirrhosis. So you have all of these issues. You can also have some colitis, as I'm showing in um, these images. Um, so the mechanism of disease is thought to be due to a massive release of parasite antigens and binding of these antigens to antibodies. And then you have immune complexes that now you kind of can't clear because there's just, there's just too many of them. Um, and if you look at lab results, the lab results actually kind of support this. So you'll see mass leukocytosis, which makes sense as, you know, the white cells try to 
fight off this massive parasitic burden. Since it's a parasite, you can expect to see a lot of eosinophilia. Um, and then you also have polyclonal gammopathy. Um, this is basically a form of hypergamma globulinemia. Basically, um, you have a ton of antibodies in the blood of all sorts of different antigen varieties. And that kind of makes sense when you think about the antigenic variation that's associated with schisto. So I just want to briefly touch on Katayama syndrome. So Katayama syndrome um, is really a result of migration of immature worms. So with KS, you see marked fever and chills and cough, and you can also see urticaria. So urticaria is kind of like chronic hives covering um, a large portion of the body. You'll also see abdominal pain, arthralgias. Um, Katayama syndrome tends to begin approximately one to two months after your primary exposure or your first exposure in a long time, and it can last for as long as three months. So um, let's just touch briefly on diagnosis and treatment. So for diagnosis, you're gonna wanna find the eggs in the patient's stool or urine. That's kind of your best option, um, doing that by microscopic examination. Remember, schisto is one of those diseases that can last for decades. So serology is really not going to be very helpful. You might see a ton of antibodies, but it won't tell you how long the patient has had it or if that's what's causing disease today. So um, it's available. It's just not going to help you much because it doesn't rule out that past infection. Um, treatment, prosequantel is a good option. Um, and then for prevention and control, I want you to think again about that fresh water thing. Um, improving sanitation, control of human fecal deposits, because remember, if we're finding the eggs in the stool, the stool contaminates the water supply, the snails get the stool, now it's got that, um, that kind of intermediate host that it needs, and that's kind of how we develop this. Um, and then if you can control the reservoir hosts, that is also very helpful.